Welcome to Psych Sessions, conversations about teaching and stuff. I'm Garth Newfeld, along with Eric Landrum, your podcast hosts. As the name implies, we center on conversations about teaching, but we often veer into other interesting topics, which is the in stuff. This is episode number 112, where Eric had the opportunity to interview Leslie Durham, his boss, the Interim Dean of Arts and Sciences at Boise State University. But before we get to that, Psych Sessions is sponsored by Macmillan Learning. In the classroom, whether in person or on screen, content matters. At Macmillan Learning Psychology, they're committed to providing exceptional course materials, helping their authors develop distinctive approaches to psychological science. But they're also committed to listening to instructors, learning how they can help, and providing the tools and support that instructors need to make teaching a little easier so that you have more time to focus on, you know, teaching. Macmillan Learning Psychology, because content matters most when teachers have what they need. Go to macmillanlearning.com backslash psych sessions for a free content preview exclusively for psych sessions listeners. That's macmillanlearning.com backslash psych sessions you know 2020 was a great year for psych sessions we were able to add hosts and new programming and i want to make you aware of all the things that we've got going on as a result of those changes and what we have coming as well first please check out ask psych sessions with marianne lloyd also social psych sessions with host anna Rop, and releasing season two shortly Garth and Sue Talk, a podcast about teaching topics. We've got more coming your way in 2021, new hosts, new programming, so stay tuned. If you want to stay in the loop on Psych Sessions programming and events, please join our opt-in email list. It's at bit.psychsessions-email. That's bit.ly backslash sessions dash email one more time bit.ly backslash psych sessions dash email now before you hear eric and leslie have a conversation from an insider view at boise state please allow me to share some of my listening tips and my favorite moments now as we get into this episode i want you all to imagine something i want you to imagine interviewing your superior, your boss. What would that be like for you? Would that be pleasant or unpleasant? How would you approach the questions? Would you be honest when you're asking the questions or would you hold back some? Would it depend on whether you have tenure or not? I think that all those things are probably in play here. This interview has a bit of a different feel to it. And if you've listened to many of Eric's interviews, you are going to sense that this one has some uh, nuance to it because uh, Eric is interviewing his boss. And so while Eric often politely says to our guests and reminds them that as this question is coming, you can feel free to decline and we can edit it out. I heard this a little more in this particular conversation than I do in a typical conversation, and that is because, I'm almost certain of it, Leslie Durham is Eric's boss. And I don't know if we consider administrators bosses, um, but they have an interesting conversation about that. All that to say, it was interesting to hear Eric navigate these questions with somebody who is in this administrative position. Um, And Eric didn't say it so much, but I know that Eric has been in this position of division chair, uh, department head, I forget what they call it there. Um, And sometimes when his questions are coming out to Leslie, uh, that he is probably relying on some of his own experiences uh, that he has taken on in this role um, of the psychology department uh, at Boise State University. I think there are some things that you experience on an administrative level um, that you don't get if you are just doing your job in uh, teaching and research and service. I liked hearing Leslie talk about uh, moving from her position as a theater professor 
And, and by the way, as they talked about that a little bit, I realized that there is so much we don't know about the disciplines of other folks. For example, when I heard that she had a PhD in theater, I thought to myself that she must have um, a theater experience on stage. I don't know why I jumped to that, but I suppose it's like when students jump to a conclusion that because somebody has a PhD in psychology, they are probably doing some sort of counseling. But uh, we learned that she likes to be behind the scenes, even though Leslie didn't do a lot of acting in uh, high school, undergraduate or graduate school. She did pick up on these things, which I think have served her really well as a dean. And I'm not sure that they said this explicitly, but uh, they talked about being overwhelmed um, and I can't remember if they spoke about it, if I was just thinking about it, but as a dean, they talked about conflict, and I think those administrators really do have to deal with more conflict, maybe than faculty do, or it's a different level of conflict anyway, Um, and uh, she refers to, I think, Michael Scott from The Office as middle management, and that's the job that uh, maybe a dean has, and that's the position that they are put in, which I thought was pretty funny, but um, in, in those unpleasant situations which they chat about... I think that experience does help Leslie um, not to feel overwhelmed, to be in that position and to not get flustered. She has this beautiful way of talking about conflict as part of story. um, And I think it taps into her uh, second degree, which was not only a theater, but in English. And so you'll want to hear that. I think it might be actually a really helpful tool for many of us out there. Um, who deal with conflict at our institution or maybe even uh, in our personal lives as well. It was a really, really helpful way of thinking about things. Eric and Leslie talk about her positivity. She said that she learned once from somebody else that the dean should be the most positive person at a meeting. That would take an amazing person, but I think that Leslie is one from listening to her uh, talk to Eric. And so, uh, you know, for any of us, I do think this is a great practice to get into um, in order to avoid uh, politics and infighting, which makes deans and and department heads jobs so difficult um, to be that positive presence in a room, uh, I think is really, really important. In the end, this turns out to be just a really lovely conversation between two people who work at Boise State University for uh, the best outcomes possible for the institution and for their colleagues and for students. There's a great respect between Eric and Leslie, and they talk uh, lovingly in some ways about their uh, colleagues and about their institution, and they are both so student centered in the way that they think about their job. So uh, without further delay, here is Eric Landrum with Leslie Durham. Welcome to another episode of Psych Sessions. I am so thrilled to be talking today with Dr. Leslie Durham from the College of Arts and Sciences at Boise State. Hi, Leslie. Hi, Eric. Thank you for having me today. Thank you so much. And this is extra special for a number of reasons of which the layers I hope it will get into over the over the next few minutes of our conversation. So Leslie serves as the interim dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, but you're I'm not going to even get your the title of your home department correctly. What, what's the official title of your home department? The official current title of my home department is the Department of Theater, Film, and Creative Writing. Now, when you first arrived at Boise State, what was the title? Then it was the Department of Theater Arts. Okay. So was there like a a, a friendly takeover or there was just a, a natural expansion? What happened there? A very friendly expansion. And I would say back when we were theater arts, we were um, we represented more than one art form then that my colleague Marla Hansen is our sole professor of dance. And so that's why we were theater arts, not just theater to recognize that there was more than one performing art involved. And now we have expanded um, to include colleagues in film and creative writing. And um, at least from where I sit in the college office, it is a huge success. I am missing being closer to my colleagues and being able to experience what it's like to be in this expanded department up close. 
you I, I would imagine that you would have to miss it. I, I just can't, you know, you, you train your professional career to do that thing. And don't get me wrong, I, I and we'll get into this. I think the thing that you're doing right now is really critically important. And by the way, uh, whether we were on a podcast or not, I would tell you that I believe you do it really well. And I, I'm Thank glad you. you're I'm glad you're doing it. But but it, it must at times ache a little bit not to do that that thing that you've been trained to do. I do miss it though. I really do feel like I use a lot of the skills that I learned in theater in the dean's office. Right. I'm I'm sure you do. And so for our listeners, uh, so uh, Leslie or, or Dean Durham, as I would call her at times and probably in front of students. Uh, I, I'm the chair of psychological science here at Boise State, and Leslie is the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And so uh, on this podcast, Leslie's my boss. And so this is kind of a, a fun kind of uh, interaction. And do you, do you take kindly to the boss moniker or does it rub you the wrong way? It feels strange to me. I feel like we are colleagues and right. um, it it still surprises me when people say that. I, you know, I, I, I feel exactly the same way. My colleagues in psychological science will, will sometimes surprise me with, uh, yeah, Eric, he's my boss. And, you know, I, I think the same way you do. Technically, that is correct. If there was a reporting line and if I'm in the HR system, that's what it says. But I think of them as my colleagues and my friends. Uh, I, I don't think of myself as their boss, but I guess technically when I have to do an annual valuation, that's when it does come into play. Yep. That is one of the rare times when it feels like we play those roles. The rest of the time, at least I hope, it feels more collaborative and less hierarchical um, than boss suggests. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things I wanted to to kind of have you talk about, you know, most of our listeners would typically be uh, teachers of psychology from all walks of the academic sphere, whether high school teachers, community college, college, four year, two year, all of that, um, university teachers. And I, I think there's probably not only within higher ed, but also outside of higher ed, uh, probably misunderstandings or misnomers about what a dean does. And I, I'm i guessing there's no universal answer, but Leslie, could you just take a little bit and talk about um, what does a dean do? I mean, I think I might have asked you this jokingly before, why in the world would you want to be a dean, you know, in kind of a half-hearted voice, but could you just speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, I think the role is certainly multifaceted. But one of the best parts of the job is being the storyteller in chief for the college and the champion for the people within the college that particularly in a college of arts and sciences and at some places across the country, those it is not a comprehensive college of arts and sciences, as, as perhaps many of your listeners know, that sometimes um, what's in our arts and sciences can be two, three, even four separate units. But one of the joys is being able to try to advance the work of this incredibly diverse group of scholars and learners and creators. And that's a privilege because the people in our college are amazing um, and that they are willing to let me try to support them and tell their story is um, it, it really is an honor. Um, That's not all that I do though. Um, Certainly I have budgetary responsibilities. I have personnel responsibilities. I have fundraising responsibilities. I have student support responsibilities. Um, But all together, it's about bringing those different kinds of work together in support of this community that is the college. And that I think is pretty cool. Um, Yeah, I feel like I'm really lucky to have a job like this. And you have painted it so well. You, you uh, you, You have 
you've actually made it sound like a really desirable job, to be honest with you, uh, which, which I think is a credit to you and, and a credit to what you do. But, you know, the, one of the interesting things of being a department chair and serving on what we call here at Boise State at Chairs Council and, and getting to work with you and see you pretty much weekly uh, is that. I get to see the difficult things that a dean gets to deal with. So you didn't mention any of the difficult things in that very eloquent description of what you do. What are what are some of the, you know, speaking generally, of course, what are some of the icky, crappy things that a dean has to deal with that you just dread or, or wish you didn't have to do? I guess before I try to think about naming some things that are appropriate in this context. Yeah, and, um, I, and I do mean generally, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, as as you were first posing the question, I was thinking about talking about the dean as a middle, middle manager. And that's usually something that people aren't dreaming of becoming, perhaps. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um you know, you might think of the office or other uh, other places where in popular culture we've had depictions of middle managers. Um, but it's actually a pretty, on the good days, it's a pretty interesting place to sit in an organization. Because while it is challenging and even occasionally icky um, to try to bring the perspectives of upper administration to faculty and then faculty perspectives back up, um, it, it can be challenging, right? Those, those groups have very different perspectives on the institution sometimes and trying to align them so that we can move forward together. Um, sometimes it's hard and sometimes it's a strange spot to be in, but it's also a pretty important spot to be in because I think both groups want to do good work and they want good things for our students. And it just, the longer you spend with one kind of perspective, maybe the harder it can be to appreciate the other one. So I think, I think that's an important part of a Dean's work. So what, what is icky? Um, It's icky when people don't get along and when it's hard to, um, to help them get along when things work out, of course, it feels really good, but sometimes when you're in conflict, of course, it, it's challenging. I Yeah, I would imagine that at, at your level, anyone at your level, um, at Boise State and beyond, uh, you have to be willing to confront conflict and that a, a good middle to upper level management person has to conf- has to confront it and you can't bury it because it just doesn't go away. That's right. And I think you have to be able to see for yourself and help others see that conflict is healthy within an organization um, or it can be. And so trying, trying not to um, avoid it, trying to enter into it respectfully, enter into it constructively, I think that's important. And actually back to to where we started, maybe that's part of where a background in theater helps because theater is about conflict in dramatic storytelling. Um, And so I think it helps me not just see conflict as a negative, but as something that will eventually help propel us forward if if we can manage it well. So do you, uh, this could be interesting. Do you think of like... maybe interactions isn't the right word, but do you think of um, situations within a college or negotiating situations almost in three acts with like a beginning, middle, and an end? And do you look for the conflict resolution and the denouement? And I mean, do you, is, is that kind of the structure that you kind of expect? Is that, is it, is that what you mean by when you're drawing on that theater background? Yep. I do think about the arc of a story and trying to appreciate when I'm in a conflict situation, where we might be in the arc of that story. Um, And part of what's helpful in thinking about it that way is that you know that it will come to an end. Um, There are different ways to get to the end, perhaps, but it doesn't mean that you're stuck in one spot forever. So that 
it is part of the way that I think about things that try, trying to appreciate at what point in the story different players think that we may be experiencing, trying to help move them to a healthier part of the story. Um, And just realizing that we won't be in the same story forever, no matter what the story is. I I just realized one thing I don't don't think I knew about you. And then I just, I just had a reinforcing idea about you and you can see if you agree with these or not. First, I think you would make a terrific fighter pilot. Because, be, because <laughs> Except you, I get airsick, Eric. I take okay, Dramamine okay. when I get on an airplane, so I don't think you want me to be the pilot. But, but what, what I mean by that is you sound like you can be very calm, cool, and collected in a high-stress situation because you have found a way to tell yourself, we're just in the middle of this arc, and we're going to get through it. In fact, we always get through it. We don't know exactly how it's going to end, but it's going to end and it'll be over and we go on to the next thing. Is is that That fairly? That is part of the way that I process the stress of my job. Yes. That, um, and, and the pleasure of the job that you can't, you can't dwell on the good parts forever either. You have to keep, keep moving ahead. I'm not sure that I'm super fond of the phrase continuous improvement, um, that administrator types use, but to some degree, I do embrace it with this kind of thinking. And the other thing that just got reinforced for me that I, I think we've chatted about before and, and some place in time, probably over pizza, would be um, you are an eternal optimist, aren't you? I try to be. Um, one of the things that I learned at one of the first uh, councils of College of Arts and Sciences conferences I went to it's a conference for arts and sciences deans was that the dean is always supposed to be the most optimistic person in the room. Now I don't remember which dean on which panel exactly said that, but, but that thought stuck with me. And when, when I do feel myself drifting a little more negatively, particularly when I'm with a group, I try to steer myself back. And I think that it, it's not helping anyone for me to be negative. You know, something that we've talked about as as a group in a in a leadership type situation is that uh, you as the dean and a bunch of you know yahoos as sixteen chairs in the in our college, uh, you give us a chance to um, kind of vent up to you, so to speak. Do do you ha- ever have any chance to vent up to about what's going on in your professional work life? I would say I probably tend to vent across more. There's a there's a pretty strong community of deans at arts and sciences. And, you know, of course, sometimes our units can be a little bit competitive with each other. There's some of that, too, but not not much, I would say, overall. And being able to vent across is probably um, where I feel the greatest kind of uh, relief right now. Okay. So it, Leslie, if you don't mind, I want to switch gears a little bit. And, sure. Um, rather than do reverse chronology, I think I'd just rather go chronology. Um, I I can't imagine that any little girl or little boy grows up thinking, I want to be a dean when I grow up. So um, what gr- growing up, what do you remember what the aspirations might have been? I remember having a couple. Um, One was I wanted to be a teacher, that there was a rather large family that lived across the street from me. And even though some of the kids were older than I was, I almost always got to be the teacher when we played school um, because it, it avoided conflict within their family. So I got to show up and um, be the teacher and I enjoyed that. Um, I did write, I tried to write as a child, um, in a couple, (laughs) across a couple art forms. Um, so I had some interest there and I don't remember exactly why I decided at one point I wanted to be the secretary of state of the United States, but I remember wanting to be the secretary of state. That is awesome. What a, what an awesome aspiration to have as a child. That, I that don't know why great. I had it though. Um, uh, 
my I come from a divorced family and we did watch news during dinner quite a lot because it kept um, kept us from having <laughs> conversations at the table. And so maybe that's where that came from. I'm not okay. sure. And if, if you don't mind, wh- where did you grow up? I grew up in Lawrence, Kansas. Lawrence, Kansas. All right. And brothers and sisters? I have a younger brother. A younger, and, and again, this, first off, you, you know that we can edit anything. So if I go, if I cross a boundary, first of all, I'll, I'll apologize. And secondly, we'll edit. Um, uh, how much younger is he from you? He is four and a half years younger. Okay. So that's a pretty big gap. Yep. I was, I was close to, isn't it, if there's a five-year difference? That, wow. That, very that's good. Kind yes. of, yep. Being yeah. a de facto only child. So yeah. I am, I was teetering on the brink of only, only childness. Right. So, so you didn't go to high school at the same time, essentially. No. Mm-mm. Yeah. So, so you, you know, maybe in grade school, you were in the same school, but you probably junior high or high school, you weren't even in the same building. Exactly. Okay. So you were the older sister, the older, responsible, firstborn sister, and really, in some ways, the only child. Yes, of uh, of academics. I grew up in an academic family. Okay, so that makes my next question moot. I almost always ask my guests, was the question growing up if you would go to college or what college you would go to? But clearly, that sounds like it was answered for you. Yes, that was answered for me from a very young age. And so, and again, this is one of these things that were sometimes people just don't want to answer this. Were you, were you active in high school? Were you in theater? Were you in plays in high school? I actually did not um, really do theater. I did some through a church group, but I did newspaper and student council in high school. Newspaper and student council. Were you the uh, newspaper editor by chance? I was the features editor. Features editor. Okay. And I was the secretary. I guess that's as close as I got to secretary of state of the okay. student council. You still have time for secretary of state, by the way. I can work on it. I did turn fifty though in August, so I I should um I should speed up speed up the clock a little bit. I actually think you're coming into your prime for secretary of state. I mean, okay, maybe so. I, I think so. And, and, and so where did you do your undergraduate? I got my undergraduate degree at the university of Virginia. Univers- so you got out of the home state. I did, but I went to the place my parents met there in graduate school. Oh, very, very nice. And did you and go my there? grandmother lived in Richmond, uh, Virginia. So it was a it was a way to go away from home, but still have some support not that far away. Oh, that that is lovely. And did you what what did you declare as a major when you first arrived? Uh, I was an English major first, and I did finish the English major, and it was an English class that led me to um, what was called at UVA, at least at the time, the drama department. So it was a Shakespeare class. So you you graduated with a bachelor's degree in English? Yes, English and drama. Okay, so... So, see, I have to do these probing questions. Otherwise, you wouldn't have fessed up that you were a double major, would you? I was a double major, yes. I thought I was going to be a political science major, but I couldn't get into political science the first semester. And I did take theater history the first semester I was there, but it was really the Shakespeare class that made me a a drama major. And do do you remember what was it about that class that sparked your interest? I loved this professor. I thought he was incredibly brilliant and um, I was quite impressionable at the time. And he said, you know, love these plays as much as you think you love them. But if you really want to understand them, if you if you really want to to appreciate what's happening here, you need to go over to the theater and figure out what they do. And I I. I took him seriously. I did that. I went over to the theater and I guess I never came back. I don't know that he expected me to get a PhD in theater, but that was um, how I responded to his suggestion. Wow. Wow. And this was an English professor. This was an English professor. Yes. Arthur Kirsch. Wow. And so if, if you, I, I just want to think about that for a minute. If, if he had said, 
if you really want to understand the behavior in these plays, go over to the psychology department. And, then we might be departmental colleagues, Eric, do you oh, think? Well, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, uh, just from my curiosity, was it, was it the persona of the instructor that inspired you or, or was it the, do you know where I'm going? Was it, yeah. was it the topic? I, I the actually remember a line from his lecture this day. And I, I remember, I just thought it was the most interesting notion. And he said, theater is the word incarnate. And I appreciated, I think, the levels of the, the kind of spiritual religious quality of that word that he chose for what theater is. And I thought, wow, that, that is something worth figuring out. Wow. What what an inspiration. Does he does he know what kind of effect he had on your career? Does he know what <laughs> No, I, I meant that, that in a I good took way. His advice in this way and that um I don't know what, 30 years later, um, I still remember. I mean that wouldn't it be wonderful if we had that kind of positive um impact on our students that we really changed somebody's lives and lit them up in a way that kept them curious and interested for three decades. That, that would be quite something, but um, no, I, I didn't, it was a large lecture class, actually. English classes um, were large lecture classes at the University of Virginia, many of them. Well, I actually think that from time to time, we do light up students like that. It's just that students either might not know it at the time, might not connect it, or they know it and they just don't take the time to tell us. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, you can, you clearly connect it, but, uh, you know, maybe he's passed away now, or maybe you just didn't get the chance to. Um, but, but we know that the instructors have that impact from time to time. Yep. Maybe, maybe I should see if he still has the University of Virginia email and, and send him an email. I would, I, I expect he's retired at this point. So. Yeah. I, I, I would imagine. So I, I tried to connect with my um, graduate school mentor, uh, the person who, who directed my dissertation committee and a couple of years ago, and I found out I was too late that he had passed away about 18 months prior. And I really regretted not, not doing that sooner. It's, one of those things that I, I should have done quicker. Yeah. What, uh, where, so you, you, uh, two bachelor's degrees because one just wasn't enough. And then what did you, where did you go from there? Do you go straight into a doctoral program, a master's program? I'm, I'm afraid I don't know the arts side of that educational path as well. Yep. I went straight into a master's program um, and did the master's and the PhD both at the University of Kansas. Okay. Is that a, forgive me, is that a DFA? What would that, what would that be? No, it's a PhD that, okay. um, yes, DFAs are possible, but, and MFAs are, are also possible, but I have an MA and a PhD because mine are the more academic degrees as opposed to the more artistic degrees. And would you mind spelling out for our listeners what those what your degrees are in? Uh, I believe on my diploma, it actually says it's a PhD in theater and film because the department there was a department of theater and film. But really, I studied theater at the University of Kansas. So an MA and a PhD in 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 theater. And that I did um, I did theater history and dramatic criticism, but the program at the University of Kansas also allowed students to do artistic work as well, that sometimes there's a pretty strong division um, between the scholarly programs and the artistic programs, but that was one that allowed some blending, and I did quite a bit of directing when I was in graduate school. Uh, so, And I think we've had this conversation, you don't really prefer to be on the stage, but you prefer to be backstage. Yes, absolutely. I am. I am far more comfortable um, backstage or in the dark cheering on the incredibly talented artists on the stage. Okay. Have you ever acted or performed at, at any time? I did as an undergraduate. Um, 
I, I, and I took some classes in graduate school. And then a couple of years ago, I did perform the role of a dean in a staged reading um, oh, in, a, in a theater festival in town. So oh, that, that was oh, fun. I'll bet that was great fun. Oh, my goodness. But what, you're um, an actor. I'm not supposed to ask you questions. Oh, you can I'm ask happy. me anything you want. You're my boss. You can ask me anything. <laughs> I don't want to disrupt the flow of, of the conversation, though, no. but I know that you have theater experience, too. I, I do. I, I got a chance to act more in high school than college. In high school, I was able to have the starring role in a lot of plays that we did. In college, I never had a starring role. Uh, there was way better competition for starring roles. And so I, I did a lot of stage crew work in college and I was in smaller roles, but, uh, um, you know, I, I really don't have much, much, uh, space to tease you about a double major because I was a double major in college, uh, with psychology as one. And then it's a really long department speech communication and theater arts was the second one. So that uh, is a nice long department name. Yeah. I, I too love the theater and like you, I, there are so many skill sets that I take from that degree and that training that I've used so much throughout my college professor career. I'm totally indebted to those professors for the gifts that they gave me. So, Eric, may I take us on a slightly different track? I don't know if you're picking up the background noise. I, I first off, I I don't think it's noise at all. Um, <laughs> well, right now it's scales. <laughs> yeah, they sound pretty good. Okay, well, I could ask for that to stop if we took a little pause. But if you are okay with that atmospheric um, color that tells you something about my current, um, both my current work life and my family life. I'm happy to, to continue as we, as we are. You know what, you know, in the COVID pandemic and, and doing this and you're doing me a favor, let's not disrupt your daughter from practicing okay. her scales. Let's not. Uh, did you play an instrument? Uh, I played the viola. That's what you're hearing. Um, for the scales, but she is so much better at it than I ever was. Yeah. My, my daughter played the viola as well. And, uh, I played the French horn. So nice. Yeah. And I, I enjoyed it. I was never very good at it. I never got beyond third chair. I wasn't serious enough. Um, and, and here's a tidbit that I rarely talk about publicly at my junior and senior year in high school, I was actually the drum major. So there nice. are fo there are photos, but thank God they're not on Facebook of me in uh, polyester pants and a flowing shirt with a sash and the big poofy hat and the baton, and it was all decked out. You know, you know, back in the nineteen seventies, it was the full full gear. Well, I will uh, I will repay your your bravery in sharing that image with your listeners. Um, something that I didn't talk about with my college experience, and so it was not being on stage, but I did dabble in some performance art. And there was a photo of me in the university newspaper doing my performance art, which was I'm not entirely sure what our point was, but the the lawn is a big thing at the University of Virginia and we wanted to be on the grass and for some reason we had flower pots on our heads so there <laughs> it's yes and it's it had something to do with women's labor and the lawn and anyway it was um loosely conceived but there was a rather odd photo of me I I don't believe it's on Facebook well, I'm just going to try to leverage the power of Google Photos after we're done here. And um, you never know what you can find, you know. Yeah, you never know. And our 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 colleagues on the Chairs Council do occasionally like to show um, photos, throwback Thursday photos or whatever the phrase is. So if you can find it, I do think you should share it with the chairs. Okay, so this may not be the venue and we may end up editing this part, but I... I <laughs> I, I did a little research before, you know, we were going to chat today because, you know, I don't often interview deans. And so I wanted to, you know, do my, you know, my due diligence. And so first off, I discovered that um, when I do a search for you, 
uh, many of the things that you've published are not exactly published under Leslie Durham. Uh, they've been published under Leslie Atkins Durham. Correct. I w- would assume that Atkins is your maiden name. It is. Um, I don't know if if you know this, but there is. A, we have a colleague in the College of Education, and her name is Leslie Atkins Elliot. And when she came to campus, I thought that was just quite surprising. And um, our our current provost. Uh, asked me, because she's an excellent scholar and an interesting new member of the community, he asked me if I had met Leslie Atkins. And I just couldn't process. <laughs> I was like, I've known her all my life. Right. So this philosopher dude is asking you some sort of weird question, right? Yeah, I thought he was trying to blow my mind and he, right. he succeeded. It's uh, and so that that ta- that tossed me for a while until I found some Google photos of Leslie Atkins Durham that then confirmed, oh, okay, I, I'm going to make the leap that 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 this is the, indeed the Leslie that I know. So, and which led me to to many books that you have published about the theater and history and theater and women in theater as well. So, I actually did do some homework. I'm impressed. And did I've you discover impre- my I, first name, though, Eric? I I did. Yes, I, I did indeed. And so, um, you you don't do the thing that I do. Uh, I don't go by my first name. I go by my middle name. I go by my middle name too. And I, when I was younger, I went. I tried using the S S period, and then Leslie Atkins. Um, and maybe that was part of why I really tried to keep the Atkins in there um, earlier in my career to have the Leslie Atkins Durham. But then I think I just got lazy and just gave up and shortened it to Leslie Durham. Right. I, I, I did. And so I, you know, when I publish, I actually publish under R. Eric Landrum. So my middle name is Eric. My first name is Ronald. I, I will not... I will not pressure you to reveal your first name, although I'm okay admitting that my first name is Shannon, but I have never used it. And it, you know, when they try to call me that when I board an airplane or something, I I always look at them between that and the drama. I mean, I look at them rather. <laughs> I look a little confused. Well, and you know, I grew up a Navy brat, so my dad was in the Navy for 26 years, and when when you're in that situation, you go to a Navy hospital and you never see the same doctor. And so you pull the record and that's the only place in my life I was ever called Ron in a regular setting. They look at your record and they call you by your first name because they assume everyone on the planet. And I just didn't, I got to a point where I just stopped correcting them. It was just easier because I'm going to see this doctor once in my life and never again. So why bother correcting them to call me Eric? So. Right. Sometimes it's just not worth it. Oh, absolutely not. So, um, absolutely. So, so was going to Kansas for your doctoral training, kind of that attempt to go back home to get closer to home? Um, somewhat. Uh, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do when I graduated from college and I went home for the summer to think about it. And I applied to the master's program somewhat for want of a better idea. Um, And they were able to give me some funding. And so I started school and loved graduate school. I, I took a rather leisurely um, path through graduate school. I was in graduate school for the entire Clinton administration. Um, And I re-met my husband there. So, um, that, that was another reason to linger in graduate school. Okay. So when, when you say it like that, you know, I have to ask, right? You, yes. you didn't meet him there, but you re-met him there? I re-met him. Um, I, I saw him again for the first time on my first day of teaching. Um, it was the first day I was going to teach as a graduate student. And I passed him in the crosswalk and I thought, huh, there went Craig Durham. And uh, we went we went to high school together, but we were not high school sweethearts. Oh, gotcha. So I knew Craig Durham in high school, but we did not date and we crossed paths again. So, yeah, you go off to Virginia, you do your thing, you get your two degrees, and then you come back and you see him again. 
and I see him again. He was on the way to his law school class. I was on the way to teach um, introduction to theater on my 23rd birthday. So let me ask you this question. And again, I, you always have full editorial control. Uh, you saw him and you re-met him. On that same occasion, did he see you? I'm not sure that he did. We um, we had mutual friends who set us up. Oh, okay. And on here, here's one for your listeners or just for you if you choose to edit it out. On oh, our I, first... I, I, I won't edit it out, Trump. <laughs> Unless you tell me. We rode a mechanical bull because Kansas. Absolutely. A mechanical bull. Yes. It, um, yes. Okay. And, and, all right. So I, I have to ask I'm so sorry. Did you both have your own cowboy hats? Uh, you, you don't have to have a cowboy hat to ride a mechanical bull, as it turns out. Okay, but but actually, you? neither one of us have cowboy hats. I do own a pair of cowboy boots. Okay, would you like a cowboy hat? I would love a cowboy hat because I I think the that chairs count huh? the chairs council could give <laughs> you a cowboy hat. I think that could happen. Oh my gosh! All right, and then uh, the rough timeline would be from the time you you re meet him. Um, how much time does it take before you are married to him? If you don't mind me asking. I think we were married in about, about a year and a half later. Wow. That, that seems a, kind of fast, but maybe not. You know, it, it did not at the time, but, um, so we got married when we were 25 and now we're 50. And I think we were babies at the time. Of course, I didn't think that then, but mm -hmm. um, yes, hard hard to believe now. So this year you'll have your twenty fifth wedding anniversary. We did. Uh, we did in twenty twenty. Oh, in twenty twenty. Okay. Yep. Well, congratulations. That's thank you. You know, these days that is quite a feat and something to be celebrated. Seriously, it is. Though it was a little hard to have a very dramatic celebration yeah. during a pandemic. So maybe maybe we can make up for that on um, your. 26 or 27, depending on how things are going. Well, I, I think there's going to be a lot to celebrate once this pandemic is over. That's Indeed. Sure. So was your first job after uh, graduate school, after your doctorate, uh, Boise State? Uh, so I finished in December and I did a visiting assistant professor at Washburn University in Topeka while I was still um the title at the time was lecturer at the University of Kansas. So I was doing both jobs and then moved here um, after the school year. Okay. So in 2001. And so And came in as a tenure track assistant professor. Yes. And I, I do have to ask this, I'm afraid, and you can decline to answer. Uh, when you got here, was Richard Clouch the chair of the theater department? He was indeed. He has been my only, I think of him as being my only chair. I, I'm so sorry for your experience. I, on, on behalf of Boise State University, I want to, I want to apologize right now. for. I adore Richard. He, he gave me a chance when there was little reason to and has put up with me going on this administrative adventure and been supportive as our roles have changed. And that, that's really pretty incredible. Well, we we really shouldn't tell him this, but I adore him too. And so we won't tell him any of this. Well, we will tease him when next we see him, but your listeners can know how we actually feel. Yeah, we'll just shove a donut in his mouth, and he'll be happy. And the, the, especially if it has sprinkles, we will call it good, and we will just let people think whatever they want to about the sprinkles. Absolutely, you bet. A absolutely. So how? So you're you're doing your gig. You're doing a th you're a theater professor, assistant professor, and I get, we're kind of coming full circle now. What what in the world makes you want to become an associate dean? I, I, I guess wh what mechanism you know was it just the kind of you got bored with, with the challenge or you saw an opportunity or you saw you want to stretch your skill set or 
what's what's that all about? All, all of the above, I think. Um, yeah, I did like the challenge. I I did want to build new skills. I had enjoyed working with colleagues in other parts of the college through things like the Arts and Humanities Institute. And, you know, as I was saying, I've, I've always been around the university. I've always played school. I wanted to learn more about how the university worked. And it was a great opportunity to do that. Yeah, you, 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 know, you call it playing school, but you, you play really seriously. I do. I, 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 um, my husband actually doesn't like to play board games with me <laughs> oh. because I'm a little too competitive. Oh, interesting. So yeah, you're one of those people. My house. So, so, um, I play to win Eric. You, so I, I know you have a daughter. Do you have any other kids? No, just, just my daughter, Kate. So when you, when you've played games with Kate as a child, if, let's say you played shoots and ladders or, or life or something like that, would you let her win? I would. She's the only person I probably on the planet I would let win. But if you were playing like with brother, like with your brother or family members or nieces and nephews at a family gathering, and if you, if you were playing Monopoly or something like that, you were cutthroat. Well, I think part of the problem was some of my early game playing experience was my, my father was a professor in the English department and other English professors would come over and they would play word games. And so when I was, I don't know, 10 years old, I was playing against people with English PhDs. Oh my gosh. Did you, did you ever win? Not that often, but I think that's why I want to... <laughs> I have wanted to ever since, right? But, I mean, a 10-year-old kid playing Scrabble against English PhDs, I mean, I mean, I could see where a competitive streak would grow out of that. Right. How, wouldn't the, I think it's normal for a competitive streak to go out, grow out of that, don't you? Yeah. You don't have I to mean, answer. No, I, I, I do think it's normal, especially <laughs> if dad encouraged you to sit at the table. I mean, it's right. one thing if, if he only let you watch. No, they let me this, play. Oh my gosh. And that and that had to be cool in and of itself. I mean, so all these professors got to know this little girl, right? And they got to watch you grow up and come over to the house. I mean, they were kind of part of your family. They were. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. Now I kind of want to play Scrabble because I know I'm gonna get my <laughs> I, I know I'm gonna get my butt kicked, but it's gonna be just fun to watch you rip me to shreds. We'll eat pizza and, and play word games when the when this whole pandemic thing is over. Oh my! And you know, we got actually we're gonna turn it into a fundraiser. That um, you know, there's a five hundred dollar buy in, and um, the it goes to the college, and uh, you get to play an evening of board games with the dean of the college. There you go. Right. Yeah. So no matter who wins, it goes to the college. Oh my gosh, that's great. So Scrabble, was there, so does that mean that the, the modern version, you're playing words with friends now with people? Well, back in, they also played something called Boggle. Did, oh yeah. Did you ever play Boggle? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Yep. So you're I not, think it was Boggle more often. So you're not the geeky type of Boggle player that could play like Boggle and Klingon, are you, you know? No. Because yeah. I've seen that for Star Trek uh, or Trekkers, you know, they'll play Boggle and Klingon and, you know, that's just way over my head. That it, that sounds like an extra layer of challenge. That's pretty <laughs> exciting, but not being a Trekker, I would not be able to do that. <laughs> oh my God. An extra layer. That's exciting. Okay. Good. <laughs> good. you you know, if any of your family members are listening to this, they should be getting some Christmas gift ideas, you know, for right? the next few holidays. Oh, uh, Leslie, I know I've almost kept you an hour, but I, I do have a couple more places that I wanted to go. Um, you know, I, I think faculty members, uh, as well as people outside academia, they, they prob I think faculty members sometimes have misconceptions about what a dean does. And I know sometimes when faculty members look at the org chart, they, they go, how come... 
how come that you need so many people doing this and doing that? And I got to tell you that once you're kind of in the room and you see what a dean's responsible for, you get it why there's so many staff people and so many associate deans. If there was one or even more than one, if there was one thing that you wish people understood about your job or one misconception or more than one that you could clear up, what, what do you think that would be? What would you like to clear up or, or, or unconfuse for people? That's a good question. Um, I guess I think it would have something to do with the fact that I think because Boise State is a, is a fairly resource constrained environment, how about we put it that way, um, that people might think that deans and maybe me in particular, I'm always trying to get money and take it from them. Um but what I would like them to know is that I'm trying to do good for the whole of the college and to try to use our resources as effectively as possible to serve as many people as possible as well as I can. And so I think maybe um, I imagine the faculty have questions about, about the budget and about resources and how decisions get made. And so I would I would want them to know that I I do it with the best of intentions. Yeah, I I think it's just, you know, I think we all have this kind of built in. I think bias is the wrong word, but we have this built in belief. Uh, I'm not I'm not saying it well. We're so busy doing our individual jobs, all of us, that we don't take the time to tell the story of what we're doing. You know, True. you're so busy doing all, you know, you know, 10,000 decisions a week. And even as a chair, I'm so busy doing a thousand decisions a week. Trust me, it's not 10,000 like you are, but maybe a thousand that if I'm doing all that work and you're doing all your work, we're not taking the time to, you're not taking the time to tell the college and I'm not taking the time to tell the department about what we're doing because we're so busy doing it. And so they don't get that context that you just actually really articulately said that, you know, they might not get to know why you made that cut or why you increased the budget for one unit, but decreased it for another. And, you know, they might on the surface think, oh, you took it away from one and, and gave it to the other. When in fact, that's not really what happened. It just might look like it, but you know, one was appropriated and one was local and they're really unrelated. But if you don't look carefully, you don't see that. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, it's, uh, yeah. And I, I think we're in this environment where we're so busy doing it, it. It just, it feels sometimes like we don't, we probably don't take the time to explain it or I, I know I'll just say it for me. Uh, I know I have the ego sometimes where I just don't want to explain it. Uh, maybe because I don't feel like I have to, even though I probably, if I thought about it kindly and wisely, yeah, I should probably slow down. I should, I should, probably, I should tell the faculty why I did that. I don't, I don't resent it. I just, uh, I, I was just too much in a hurry and I didn't think it through. And I think sometimes I don't know. I don't know what's interesting to other people what they want to know, how much detail they would like. Um, I a hundred percent agree that we, that I don't always communicate as much as I should with people about the work that I'm doing. I don't know which parts they want to know. Um, and I should probably just not, not worry about that. Uh, I think I, I think I have a fear of boring people. Well, I, I I can't speak for anybody else, but I, I'll speak for me. You, you've you never bored me. Like, for example, I love the new piece that you've added to the college newsletter where the staff in the office share a little bit of their personal life. Um, you know, people read far enough and long enough to the end of that newsletter. They get these really nice little tidbits about um, about what you're doing or what you're reading and when you've made – presentations to the college, you share, you know, a, the new podcast that you've been listening to or something that inspired you at the Louvre or some controversy that you've been reading about. I mean, I, 
I think people enjoy getting to know the real you because they they know the dean you if that, if that makes any sense it does i should i should try to do that more often i think well and and i'm not i and, and leslie i'm not trying to gosh for good, for goodness sakes i'm not trying to tell you to do that i just you know again there's only so many hours in the day and you know you've got people above you telling you to get this report in and for for goodness sakes you're serving on that um dreaded program prioritization committee that's probably <laughs> taking up your time. And th- then you've got, you know, tenure and promotion folders to review and 8,400 other things on your plate. So I'm assuming you're pretty busy. There's a bit of juggling involved sometimes. <laughs> the, the, I, I think you're the master of understatement. Do, do you have a safe space to brag? I mean, can you do that with your husband? Can you do that with your staff? To brag, to brag, and or complain, to, to you know, to to just let it out. Or, I mean, I don't think you're going to do it here on the podcast. But I mean, do you have that safe space somewhere? Do you ever? I do. do. You ever brag about yourself that all the cool things you've done and accomplished. I I have a safe space to t- for sure to talk about my work at home, um, and I think the the dean team, as we call them. Um, the four associate deans and and the director of strategic initiatives and operations. Um, It's a pretty amazing team in the college office. And I feel safe to share both failures and successes with that group. That director of strategic operations. It's a long title, kind of like our department names. Um, But it refers to a woman in the office named Mackenzie Phillips, who is the single most important person in the college, I think, for keeping us going. So she she does so much for so many, and her title is unwieldy, and it should just be um, – I, I don't know that it accurately conveys all that she does and how much I respect her. I think we just need it to be a pronounceable acronym. That That's all I want. I think we should invent the acronym and then, you know – backward design what it means right maybe it's the acronym should be star yes like star or um strategic team and resources that doesn't make sense i don't uh, know what star stands for we can work on it Boy, doing this live either that yeah it's dangerous it could be boring or really super entertaining um i'm not quite sure which uh yeah we maybe we should do this offline um, b- before we close out, Leslie, I, I just wanted to ask you, I, I, I can't imagine the workload of a dean. I can sort of kind of try to, but I, I don't, it's, I think it's one of those jobs you have to do it before you really understand it. Do you have any bandwidth at all for, there's this old fashioned concept, uh, people used to call it fun. Um, <laughs> do, do you have any time weekends, nights, breaks, do you, do you get a chance to power down or is it just 24 seven? It's always on your, on your mind and in your head. It is. I dream, I dream about work a lot. Maybe that's, maybe that's a good way to answer the question. Mm. Um, I wake up thinking about work. I, I do work pretty late into the evening. Um, it, it's, it's pretty all consuming, but I enjoy the work, so um, there is fun in every day for me. Okay, wow! Like I said earlier, you really are an optimist, and and I, I and to our listeners who are going, Eric, you're a jerk. First off, you're right, I am, but but secondly, I know Leslie well enough to know that this is the real Leslie. That she's not doing this because she's on a podcast. This is really her. Leslie, was there anything that, you know, you were hoping we would talk about that I have uh, sadly skipped or something that you wanted to mention or now that I, you've done this once, you're thinking now that you want to do a podcast of your own? I am glad to have had this first podcast experience. I love listening to them, but I had never tried to make one. Maybe I was interviewed. Actually, I take that back. I think I was interviewed once on a podcast. Um 
but this, it was a fun conversation. So thank you, Eric, for um, asking me good questions and having a fun conversation. And Leslie, I, you know, I, I seriously, I, I know how busy you are. I, I have some grasp of your responsibilities to the college and to Boise State University. And to ask you for a little more than an hour is honestly, it's an outrageous ask. And you're so gracious to give me that time. And I thank Mackenzie for setting this up because she did, because she's our star. We don't know what that acronym means, but we're going to work on it. And um, I also, you know, I do this a lot in the discipline of psychology that I don't have any right to do, but I'm going to switch gears and do it on behalf of Boise State, which I also don't have any right to do, but I'm going to thank you on behalf of Boise State for all that you do because you represent 16 departments and other programs and initiatives and centers and, you know, thousands of students and hundreds and hundreds of faculty members. And uh, you help make this place a better place to come to work and you're helping to make it a safe place to come to work and um, helping to improve the lives of students and faculty and staff. And I sincerely mean that. It's, I know it's not an easy job, and it's oftentimes a thankless job. And I just want to take a moment to sincerely thank you for all that you do for Boise State. That is really lovely, Eric. And um, I, I thank you for saying those nice things. I, I do truly appreciate it. And um, thank you for being on the podcast. My pleasure. Mm-hmm.